is we have to start at home. Shame has this insidious quality. Here's an exercise that you might want to try sometime. I did this for several days um, about two weeks ago. Take an index card, and um, every time you get a little jolt of shame, just write down what happened and what the shame was about. I'll give you an example. So just today, for me, I woke up this morning, I didn't feel that great, and then we went to Mass, and as I walked into Mass, I was just noticing this. We sat down in Mass, and I noticed that a lot of our friends in our parish are like Eucharistic ministers and readers, and I thought to myself, I haven't done that in, gosh, 20, 25 years. And I felt this little weight of, oh, yeah, those guys are good. There's something wrong. Like, and I started feeling like I'm really not a part of our parish because I do so much on the road and I'm gone so many weekends, it's hard for me to do stuff on the weekend liturgy. And I had this another wave of, I really don't fit here. And I found myself feeling more and more distant until finally it was like, wait, that's shame. That's not even true. Because I pray through what I do. So anyway, one thing you could consider is jotting down these areas in your life where you might feel um, a little bit of shame. And then, and I won't do this here, actually. I did this in Florida. They actually had fun. Right after half of them had heart attacks, they looked at me like there was something wrong with me. I said, now turn to the person next to you and share one of those things on your list. Something you feel shame about, ashamed of, something you feel shame about. Um, but I would encourage you, what would it be like for you to talk with one person or a couple people if you feel shame? Because here's the thing. Um, shame is not just some, you know, biological force that we all have to deal with. If you remember, shame is what I believe the number one method Satan uses to destroy us. He wants us to believe we don't have what it takes. He wants us to believe we're not a part of the community. He wants you to believe right now that you're not really Catholic enough. You're not really Christian enough, even though you're here. That's the voice of Satan. And what would it be like if we brought that into the light and started telling people about these thoughts that we have, or these fears that we have, or these things in our life that we've been afraid to tell anybody? Now, just a side note, tell the right person. <laughs> <laughs> like, this probably is not a good conversation for you to go home with your spouse and pour a glass of wine and say, you know, honey, I've kept this secret from you for 18 years, but I think I'm going to tell you tonight. Don't do that. Um, but it, I was going to make a terrible joke about it, but if you do, the Grace Council Center is just on and you're going to need us. Uh, no, but truthfully, skillfully, what would it be like if you told the right person? Um, you know, people in AA talk about... Um, uh, we're only as sick as our secrets. And I think that's true. Satan loves for us to not tell anyone because we think we're too bad. So that's the first thing we can do is start uh, at home. In fact, one thing I was thinking about is we, you know, later today, for those of you who haven't been to this before, we'll have a chance to all look at the Blessed Sacrament and experience God's presence with us. This is the way we very carefully celebrate the fact that Jesus is with us. And I always think of how cool it is to look at Jesus and say, wow, I get to look at Jesus. But what would it be like if tonight... When you look at Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, you realize that he's looking at you. And he's, he's brought you here tonight so that he can look into your eyes. And when he looks into your eyes, there's only one thing Jesus says, and that is, man, I love you. And you have this feeling that, oh, you can't love me. Did you know about that? I had, I had a confession and all that. And he said, no, 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 I love you. Stop listening to Satan. You are loved. I created you and I loved you. What would it be like if we allowed him to look at us? Are you any Lord of the Rings fans here? You know the eye? Now this metaphor breaks down because the eye is evil, but whatever. Um, you know how like when people do stuff and the eye turns and loses them? There's no Lord of the Rings fans. Okay, well if you ever watch it, you can think of it. And we'll move on. And the last thing we can do, or the second and last thing for tonight we can do, is we can bring this grace to each other. We really can't bring love. Even those people that we don't really like like a whole bunch. Uh, Karen and I are friends with a younger couple, and they're going through a really hard time, and one of the things that's gone on is one of the two has gone off and had bad relationships with other people, and they had young kids, and it's really a bit of a disaster, and we were going to get together with them, and we were talking, and we were like, man, I don't even want to get together with them. This thing is like a nightmare. It's a train wreck. It's a dumpster fire. Like, I'd rather read the Bible or something. Uh, I mean, I'd rather, I don't know, work out or something, be more medical. But we said, um, well, let's pray about it. So we prayed about it, and we looked at each other, and we shook our heads. We were like, shoot, we're supposed to meet with them, aren't we? And it's like, yeah, God is kind of encouraging us to meet with them. So we did get together with them. And now the first thing I said to him, and this is probably where it went wrong, but I'll tell you this. I said to the one person in the relationship, I said, so let me just tell you, what you're doing right now is really, like, offensive to a lot of people. You get that, right? Because there's been no remorse from the one person who's offended. And... Um, I said, you know, you do get that, right? Like, I said, like, if we're watching a National Geographic Geo 
Dragon Special, there were two zebras, and the one zebra baited with another zebra, and they had little zebras, and then that zebra went over and started baiting with the other zebras. And then a lion came and ate that zebra. Like, everyone would be good with that. So, like, like we'd be good with that if people don't like you right now. But on top of that, we just need you to know we're going to walk with you through this. We're going to love you through this. And we make lots of eye contact and we're lots of empathy and lots of, like, wow, this is a really confusing, hard time, isn't it? And, you know, part of my brain is like, of course it's confusing and hard because you continue to make these self-destructive choices that are employing the whole community. Yeah. But we didn't say that, did we, dear? We just said, this is a really hard so we're really, we got no one's heart. It's going to be confusing. Oh, and expensive. Yeah, that's right. But we did. We, and the point was lots of eye contact, lots of just empathic presence and love. And here's the deal. When that night was over, something had shifted with them. And I got a text the next day that said, we're not sure what happened, but things seem to be going in a different direction. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to say this God of ours, when it looks, when, when we let God make eye contact with us, which I think is what Karen and I were able to do with this couple. Things shift, things change. And the reason interpersonal neurobiologists would say is because shame starts healing out of the brain. And the brain can wake up and start being about love um, again. So how do we do that? I think, um, you know, we have to take Pope Francis' lead. Pope Francis says the key to, shift, to being alive in Christ today is to accompany people, to take off our shoes no matter where people are in life. They're on sacred ground. We need to let go of that judgment because here's the thing, when we're filled with shame, we tend to be judging towards other people. That's just the way it works. So if we could just do that, one final story. I think we underestimate our power to show up and be loving and present with people. I think we underestimate how much power that has. A great story told by a meditation teacher that I like called Jack Cornfield. He, Heard this story, there was a teacher, you probably heard a story like this before, and the teacher was um, having a rough day with the students, so she stopped everything and said, everyone write down one thing you appreciate about every other student in this class. And so they did, she got the papers, collated it, and then a couple days later gave them this sheet of paper that had a list of things that other people liked about people. Well, several years later, um, one of the boys in that class was killed in Vietnam. And so this teacher went to the funeral, and when the teacher got there, the mom of the boy who was killed said, hey, uh, I wanted you to know something, that my son, when he died, had three things with him. And one of them was this paper. They pulled it out and unraveled it, this beautiful paper with all these nice things that were said. And the teacher was really struck, but what was really amazing is there were two or three other students from that class there who looked at her and they said, and we have ours too. And they were able to pull this paper out and open it up and look at this. People treasure eye contact and love. And what we know now from the interpersonal neurobiologists and from the Bible beginning to end is that the reason we treasure this is because it heals shame. And once shame is healed, then we're free to love and we're free to follow our conscience and we're free to make better choices, but not until we break the power of shame. I, I, I have little cards that you can get on your way out. And there are business cards on the one side, but on the other side, um, I have some questions that might help you before you see these people that you're gonna see this Christmas. Just questions to help you love them well, to remember where they're at in life. Questions about where they are with life, where, where their challenge is, where they are with God. Just to be praying about these questions before you see the people in your life that are difficult. They're just free, just take them, we'll have some at all the exits, I guess we'll have most of them here. So let's just take a minute now if we can and pause and pray. I'd like to pray for you.